TB disease in particular. And uh, then spend a lot of our time, most, most of our time focusing on whether we should be doing more to address early TB using evidence from population studies about how much undiagnosed infectious disease there is, sort of understanding that burden, showing some uh, modeling from other, from, from my group and others, uh, mathematical modeling to try to gain insight into the uh, potential importance and impact of intervening in early TB, and then also looking at some empiric data around the potential impact of early TB interventions. And then I'll spend with, uh, with a few minutes talking about current work by my team in Uganda to try to optimize and improve interventions for, um, for early TB detection and case finding. So first of all, um, TB globally is does continue to be a problem. You know, TB is um, this disease that's been with humans for thousands of years that's um, you know, transmitted airborne transmission, causes primarily lung disease, but also diverse other clinical manifestations. And it's estimated that each year, like in 2021, 20, for example, the estimate is that more than 10 million people developed TB and that more than one and a half million people died of TB, which makes it the, like cause of death that um, ranks just second to SARS-CoV-2 the past couple of years in terms of single pathogens causing death and unlikely is, un unfortunately is likely to retake that first spot soon. We have though made progress in the over the past decade in uh, tools for diagnosis and treatment. We have more sensitive and rapid diagnostics like the sort of expert molecular sputum test shown here that gives sensitive diagnosis of TB in a laboratory in under two hours. For TB screening and population level, we have portable digital x-ray equipment and artificial intelligence interpretation that can be used for screening, which I'll tell you more about later in this talk. And we have, um, for people who have advanced immunosuppression um, and advanced HIV, there are tests that can be done rapidly and cheaply at the point of care that do a pretty good job of diagnosing TB. Uh, on the treatment front, there have also been improvements. The standard of care for TB treatment for decades has been six months of therapy with four drugs. And, um, and if you're resistant to those, then it's 18 months or more of therapy, including many months of a, of a daily injectable drug. But um, the potential duration of treatment for drug susceptible TB is now as uh, short as four months with a regimen that was successful in clinical trials for adults, as well as uh, other um, studies showing shorter regimens could be successful in children within the past couple of years. And then maybe more remarkably, that extremely long and toxic uh, drug-resistant TB regimen has been replaced with a six-month all-oral regimen that was recommended by WHO within the past year. We also have shorter regimens for uh, prevention. You can give antibiotics to people who've been infected with TB to prevent them from developing TB disease. And our options for that preventive treatment are now as short as one month. But unfortunately, despite all of these advances, the progress in reducing that global incidence of TB of more than 10 million people a year has been slow. I mean, at, at a, like in absolute numbers, it's pretty much flat at a rate per population, it's declining at only about 2% per year, and we're falling fall short, uh, far short of targets that had been set by the international community for um, dramatically reducing TB burden and ending it as a global public health problem in the first half of this century. Uh, it's also estimated that COVID was actually a setback that increased TB incidence and mortality. I think we have yet to see over the next couple of years how much of an increase there will be, but, um, but maybe we're even farther off target than we had been a few years ago. I think the question is why are these better tools for diagnosing and treating TB not making more uh, and faster of an impact? Partly, I think it's that there's underinvestment in TB in general. It affects poor people in poor parts of the world and just hasn't received the investment that it deserves on a lot of fronts. Partly, it's just it's difficult to make really rapid changes in a disease that's slow moving, has a month to years long disease course, and um, it, 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 epidemics sort of move slowly with long incubation times. But still, we're not making much progress. And I would argue that 
at least a part of that puzzle also, is that we haven't given attention to a lot of points along the disease spectrum that are potential targets for intervention. This is a schematic of how TB is, has been typically conceptualized and taught in the last few decades, where there's this dichotomous, there's latent TB or there's active TB. And those are the two things we have treatments for. People who have active TB get sick, come to the doctor, get diagnosed and get treated. People who have latent TB are um, have just been exposed at some time and we can give them preventive therapy to cure their infection and prevent them from developing disease. Uh, but I think there's growing awareness that there are, that there's a whole spectrum of disease severity in terms of clinical severity, bacterial burden, uh, risk of future poor outcomes, infectiousness along this spectrum. And that, you know, we can treat people who have recognizable symptoms. There may be people who have active disease whose symptoms are too mild or nonspecific to recognize or who really don't have any symptoms at all. And then there are on the latent side of things, there may be people who are on their way to developing TB who are sort of higher risk than the average person with latent infection and who would really be an optimal target for intervention if we could identify them. So um, what I want to ask is rather than focusing on, on symptom, on like classically symptomatic people where all of the attention around diagnosis and treatment has really been, could earlier intervention along the spectrum have more impact on those TB incidence trends and the trajectory of epidemics? So a little bit more sort of background along this spectrum in terms of what interventions we have. We've said that for latent infections, there are preventive therapies uh, that are effective at preventing progression to disease, but it's estimated that close to a quarter of the world's population or nearly 2 billion people are infected with TB. So that's a huge target population if you were going to try to deliver preventive therapy antibiotics, even a month of daily antibiotics to everyone. And then also this, uh, these survival curves from a clinical trial also illustrate that you know after this was a one year course of preventive therapy in a very high transmission setting in South Africa, and after that preventive therapy ended, the incidence of TB began to climb again, sort of in parallel with the control group. So reinfection may limit impact of preventive therapy in high burden settings if we don't combine it also with uh, efforts to reduce transmission. Vaccines are under investigation. We finally have TB vaccines that are in phase three trials, and those could be something that could be delivered more widely at a population level and could also provide protection against reinfection. But we're at least a few, way, a few years away from having, having a vaccine. And I think there's uncertainty. We need to figure out what do we do in the meantime, or if we don't have vaccines that are as promising as I think we all hope they might be. Um, moving on to this uh, incipient TB stage, with, which has different names and slightly different conceptual definitions and different sort of versions of this um, TB spectrum framework. Here it's referring to people who are sort of on their way moving from latent to active disease. It sometimes referred to as minimal disease, or it can refer to, I think there's a forthcoming framework that will talk about people who have disease, um, pathology, uh, but don't have symptoms and also don't aren't excreting bacilli from their airways. So maybe like a subclinical non-infectious state. Um, but there are so but there are people who are at high risk for developing infections, who don't have infectious TB, which is what these are over here, but who are at high risk for developing infectious TB in the near future. There was a systematic review published earlier this year by a group based in London showing that uh, in sort of published cohort studies, uh, TB appear, active TB appearing lesions on chest X-ray in people who had negative sputum testing could predict a like, close to 10% per year incidence of developing sputum positive TB 
There are also host transcriptomic biomarkers, a blood test, mRNA signatures that have been um, that are can are highly predictive of being uh, being diagnosed soon. Particularly if you're looking, you know, people within a three to six month window before diagnosis, predicting people who will be diagnosed with symptomatic sputum positive disease. Unfortunately, these markers are either transient or only weakly predictive. And how to treat people who we think are in this state? remains unclear. For example, this Cordis clinical trial found that unfortunately our standard, a standard preventive reg therapy regimen called 3HP did not reduce the incidence of TB in people who had this risk signature. I'm gonna spend a lot of the rest of our time talking about the next sort of stage along the spectrum, which is subclinical TB. Uh, uh, and the question here, which is really sort of people who are infectious, but aren't yet either symptomatic or aren't symptomatic enough to seek care. And our question here is like, what impact could we have by targeting this and how could we target it? Which really depends on how much of the subclinical TB is there, how infectious is it, what's it contributing to transmission and can we find it in a smart and efficient way? So those are questions I'm going to try to answer. Um, so the first question and figuring out should we be doing more to address early and particularly subclinical uh, or, or, or yeah, particularly subclinical TB is how much is there? And uh, I, I, my sort of qualitative sense is that there's a lot and probably more than most people who aren't uh, very familiar with these um, sort of population level prevalence data realize. Uh, there are, the shown here on the right is a summary by WHO of the more than a dozen hybrid in countries that have done a nationally representative TB prevalence survey in the last decade or two. And the what's plotted is the prevalence to notification ratio, which I'll explain here using illustrative data from Uganda. But you can see that most of these countries, most of these dots fall between one and three. Most of these prevalence ratios are in the one to three range. What that means, like Uganda's was 2.9 at the time of their survey. You can see them here. Um, what this means is that, so when Uganda conducted a national prevalence survey in 2014 and 2015, they estimated that the prevalence of TB among people age 15 and above in the population was about 400 per 100,000 or 0.4%. And then at the same time, the number of notifications in 2015 um, so the, the annual notification rate was 140 people age 15 and above notified as having TB, sort of a officially recognized diagnosis and recommendation for treatment uh, per 100,000 per year. So the ratio of these two was 2.9. It's typically um, sort of just reported as a raw number, but the units here are years. Uh, and what it means is that for every person getting notified as having TB, there are almost three years worth of prevalent sputum positive, potentially infectious TB in the population. So um, yeah, a lot of undi a lot of time spent with undiagnosed TB relative to the number of diagnoses being made. And these prevalence surveys also tell us that about half of prevalent TB is subclinical. This is a summary um, by, uh, by a group at the London School of the proportion of cases uh, identified in these prevalence surveys that responded negative to a standard symptom screen, asking things like, do you have cough? Do you have fever, night sweats? And... Um, so they were only, these people were only identified as having TB based on an abnormal screening chest, chest X-ray that then prompted sputum TB testing. And it's probably the case that our estimates of prevalent TB and our estimates of what proportion of prevalent TB is subclinical are um, underestimates because we know this is the Ill illustrative data from a Cambodian prevalence survey uh, where the people who had symptoms are at the top, people who had abnormal chest x-rays are on the right, uh, the people with a positive TB result are this quadrilateral in the middle. And we know that symptom screening missed uh, uh, TB in some of the people who were x-ray positive. So it's likely that symptom screening missed an even larger proportion of TB that was x-ray negative and vice versa. So that this sort of missing quadrant here is potentially a large proportion, a large amount of prevalent uh, symptom negative TB. 
So if there's a lot of it, I think another question is how much, how infectious is it? Um, and I think sometimes people assume that if it's subclinical, it's it's not not causing not not making people sick, it's mild, then it must all, must also be not very infectious. But we uh, we know that people can have no symptoms and still have high bacterial burdens in their sputum, something on the order of a third of cases in prevalent surveys are smear positive, for example, which is a, it's like you can see the bacteria under the microscope and that's a state that's associated with high trans infectivity and transmission. We also all have like uh, more understanding since the COVID pandemic that you don't have to be um, coughing and sick in order to transmit an airborne respiratory, respiratory infection. Um, but a couple of some, there's li I think limited data on exactly how infectious subclinical TB is, but some studies have been done to get at this question. This figure on the right, is, uh, on the left is from a study in a low TB burden uh, region in Valencia, Spain, where uh, people with TB were, um, uh, TB isolates were all sequenced using whole genome sequencing and then grouped um, phylogenetically into clusters of likely um, transmission related cases. And then um, timed transmission trees were inferred for within those clusters to, to try to estimate who transmitted to whom and when are those transmission events likely to have occurred. And uh, so this is showing the timing of the transmission events in the error bars, the onset of symptoms as triangles, and then the and the diagnosis in squares. And you can see that there were several instances circled here where the transmission event was estimated as very likely to have occurred well before as the error bar, well before the onset of symptoms shown in the triangles. So evidence that these people had probably transmitted, you know, caused these transmission events while they still had subclinical TB, or at least before their recollection of when their symptoms had started. Started. Another data point we have is from uh, some of these prevalence surveys. Data here are from the um, a prevalence survey in Vietnam, where um, so the prevalence survey looks for people who have active sputum positive disease. Uh, and then in this survey, the household contacts of the, the child household contacts of those people with active TB were evaluated for um, TB infection which in a child who has relatively few exposures to other adults in the community is often an indication that they were infected by that person in their house who currently has TB. And the results were a little bit different by age, but among the younger children, age six to 10, the risk of uh, TB uh, infection was elevated if the index case was smear positive and was elevated to a similar degree among the child household contacts of smear positive subclinical TB cases and of smear positive clinical or symptomatic TB cases. So again, a piece of evidence that um, subclinical TB really can be a, a source of transmission or at least people who have subclinical TB now which isn't to say that they didn't have symptoms at some time in the past, but that they are likely, yeah, that they, that people who have subclinical TB may have generated and may continue to generate transmission. So those are some sort of a review of what we know about burden and potential infectiousness. Um, these data uh, can be like models of disease progression can be useful for translating these sort of sorts of population level data into a better understanding of what impact might we have if we tried to intercept uh, the course of TB while it was still subclinical. Uh, the first of these is uh, from a, uh, and again, not, not, this is not my work. Uh, this is a modeling analysis by Chu Cheng Ku and Pete Dodd that basically took those prevalence to notification ratios that we talked about that I was describing a few minutes ago and translated them into estimates of how long does the average person with TB spend with sputum positive, potentially infectious TB before they get diagnosed? And how long do they spend with TB before they even start to experience symptoms? Assuming that symptoms are a progression that happens at some point before uh, diagnosis. And what they, so they 
uh, sort of accounting for the fact that some people die of TB before they get diagnosed. Some TB spontaneously resolves uh, by looking at the number of notifications compared to the number of prevalent people with prevalent TB in the population who reported that they did or didn't have symptoms and had or hadn't sought care for their symptoms. Uh, this model estimated that the average that a person with TB, depending on the country whose data they were fitting to, spends between four and 14 months with infectious, you know, sputum positive, potentially infectious TB before they develop any symptoms and then spend as least as, at least as long again, similar, similar amount of time again with um, symptomatic disease before they get diagnosed. Our uh, modeling team took this uh, a bit further in trying to not just estimate the average disease course, but trying to understand a bit about the heterogeneity of how much time different people may spend, how variable is that and is this disease course and how may it depend on other characteristics that might be important in how we go about doing uh, TB screening at a population level to find people with subclinical disease. And the motivation here is that it's unlikely that every person with TB really follows that average disease course. There are some people, um, particularly in setting, like in situations of immune compromise, where TB progresses very quickly. Once you get TB, you're going to develop symptoms. And if you don't get diagnosed and treated promptly, it's likely to lead to, um, to mortality. Uh, and these sort of rapidly progressing, your immune system isn't able to get the disease under control um, types of disease courses are clinically uh, from a you know sort of individual health impact very important are unlikely to spend a lot of time with undiagnosed TB causing a lot of transmission. On the other hand, there are um, there may be others who have a kind of a slower progression, maybe a sort of stuttering, waxing, waning TB course. Maybe they have symptoms for a little while and they get a little bit better or they're like uh, the disease just isn't severe enough to cause them to go seek out diagnostic testing or to cause a clinician to think this is someone who looks like they should be tested for TB. And uh, maybe by the time this person really develops recognizable symptoms and gets diagnosed, they've had TB for, um, for a long time, maybe even more than those, that average duration of a year or two. Uh, and then there are people who spontaneously resolve, who never get, uh, never come to clinical attention, but who may potentially spend a lot of time with TB and maybe a source of transmission, even though they never get notified as a case. So we wanted to try to understand this heterogeneity to the extent that we have data to support it. I mean, you can't do studies where you identify people with TB and follow them without treatment to see what happens. Uh, but we have several sources of data from the pre present day that we can use in, this, in, in the context of a, of a model to try to get a sense of, um, that, that we can fit a model to, like prevalence, notifications, and mortality, uh, stratified by uh, smear status in addition to totals. And then we also do have some longitudinal data from the pre-antibiotic era, or some cohorts followed in the early 1900s to the described uh, survival and time to, um, time to TB death in people who had been diagnosed with TB. And this, these data have been summarized by, uh, originally by, I guess, Adin Tamirzma, and then uh, the sort of figure is from a subsequent modeling paper by Romain Raganet. But the um, you can see that mortality is high among people who had smear positive disease, although it you know took some time to reach full um, for this to plateau. And the mortality was significantly lower in people who had been diagnosed with TB but didn't have uh, you know a positive sputum under a microscope. So we. Try it. We fit a model to all of these data simultaneously. We felt like stratifying dichotomously by smear and by symptoms was about as much heterogeneity as the data could support. And we used a Bayesian calibration procedure, IMIS, to, to, to calibrate sort of two versions of this model simultaneously with the same values for all of the transition rate parameters that are represented by arrows in this diagram. We fit a version with 
inflows from people developing TB, which we assume started as smear negative and subclinical, and with detection and treatment of um, at some rate among people who had um, smear, had symptomatic smear positive or to a greater and to a lesser extent smear negative disease would get diagnosed and treated. And then we fit another version of the model sort of simultaneously with the inflows and treatment turned off and following closed cohorts for survival and fitting outcomes in this model to those historical cohort data. And then once we had fit the model, we used our calibrated parameter values to um, simulate a population, like a cross-sectional population of people with prevalent TB and simulate what their outcomes would be in terms of whether they eventually died, resolved, or got treated and how long they spent with TB before one of those outcomes happened. And here are, here's a summary of the results of those time spent with TB um, estimates. And I've circled here the column that corresponds to people who started with smear positive subclinical TB at the start of the simulation. And our estimates were that that state was particularly likely to persist for a long time, that people with smear positive subclinical TB were estimated to spend a total of 16 months with uh, TB before death resolution or treatment. And, um, so more than any other state, and that most of that time would be uh, time would would be with smear positive and um, TB, so more infectious than the smear negative forms of disease, and um, and when we then use estimates of infectivity of different states to translate that into contributions to future transmission. What we estimated is that. Uh, this slice in yellow here, which is the people who had smear positive subclinical TB at the start of the model, only accounted for less than 20% of uh, cross-sectional uh, TB prevalence, only less than 20% of the people who had TB, uh, who had undiagnosed TB at any given time. But those people, like among the future transmission that would be caused by everybody who had uh, TB at this given point in time, those people with smear positive subclinical TB were estimated to be responsible for more than 40% of future transmission, suggesting that this could be a really important and impactful population to try to find if there were a good way to do it. And we think this potentially changes how we would think about the types of tests that you want to use for TB screening. Uh, because uh, you know, smear positive disease is relatively easy to find with a bacteriologic test, you don't need a super high sensitive, highly sensitive uh, sputum or respiratory sample test to find people who are smear positive. And maybe rather than uh, really optimizing screening tests for sensitivity, we should be thinking about developing tests that are really rapid and cheap and simple and can be um, delivered or done at a large scale sort of population wide to find those people who have the highest bacillary burdens, something like the COVID antigen tests that we are all um, familiar with, um, but, you know, thinking about that kind of target product profile for TB. There's one more modeling study that I want to tell you a little bit about, and this is moving from the individual disease course simulation over to thinking about population impact of a case finding intervention. And here, the question that our team sought out to, uh, to answer is what would be the epidemiologic impact of uh, taking these tools that we have, like um, better chest X-ray and molecular sputum testing and preventive therapy that can be given you know, over a short time period and delivered these really intensively in a population? Uh, how much of a, how large and how lasting an impact could we make on the trajectory of the epidemic in say a, um, we modeled this in, 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 in a city in India. We modeled an intensive one-time citywide campaign of chest X-ray screening for everyone 15 years and above, testing the people who screened positive with a sputum expert molecular test, um, evaluating those who didn't have TB for latent TB infection and delivering preventive therapy to those who were infected 
and then also investigating children if they were contacts of an identified case and estimating that it would be feasible to initially reach 70% of the population with the first step of this intervention. We modeled this intervention in the context of a fairly typical uh, transmission model representing the dynamics of infection and disease progression in the population. We did include stratification of active TB into asymptomatic and symptomatic forms. And we represented this intervention with realistic, as best we could estimate them, cascades of care. We assumed that initially 70% of the adult population would, would do the initial screening step uh, of a chest X-ray, but that you'd lose, um, you'd have losses at each step of completing the follow-up tests, the sensitivity of the tests, the efficacy of the treatments. So we estimated that this intervention would end up treating about 30% of latent TB infection and about 40% of active disease among the adult population at the time of the intervention, and a lot smaller proportion among children because they had to be contacts in order to be included. And the headline result here in terms of projecting epidemiological impact is that we saw a like, substantial and, sub and sustained impact on the burden of TB in this population projected as a result of this intervention, sort of a, a 25% reduction in incidence and mortality due to TB that was so slightly smaller than the proportions of latent and active TB that we estimated this could cure, and that the impact was projected to be sustained for um, you know, more than 10 years. This is the impact, this is the relative reduction in incidence at 10 years compared to what was projected without the intervention. So substantial and sustained impact. Interestingly, our model estimated that that impact was coming less from the active case finding component and was really dependent on pairing that active case finding with preventive therapy for the people uh, in whom you ruled out active TB. Um, I wanna move on from models though, to show you some amount of, of empiric evidence that case finding can have meaningful population level impact. And I'll start with this figure that summarizes data from uh, a high TB burden of native population in Alaska in the 1950s and 1960s, where there was an effort to, um, a real investment in making treatment for TB available where it hadn't been before uh, and delivering at a population scale preventive therapy, but proceeded by chest X-ray to rule out active TB and treat anyone who did have active TB and then give the others preventive therapy. And the impact on, trans, on transmission was that this population went from one where children were almost universally infected with TB by age five to one where 20 years later, infection in childhood was very rare, you know, 10% prevalence of infection at age 12. So I think the question is, can we, you know, how much of this was treatment was just available for the very first time for TB in general, and how much of it was this population-wide case finding and prevention? And is this something we could do today in other high burden settings? I want to show you a few results from a study that we recently completed, or still doing some analysis of, but have completed the field work for in Uganda, called in Kampala, called the Stomp TB study, which was an effort to understand an epidemic sort of at high resolution and that at the level of a single community, uh, when including enrolling all the people who were diagnosed with TB at any of the local health facilities through sort of normal routine TB diagnosis, uh, diagnostic services, but also an effort to find people who had undiagnosed prevalent TB through two campaigns of case finding through this community. Once in 2019, and then again in 2021, we uh, went door to door plus held screening events to try to screen everybody in this community for TB. Here are some pictures, a map of this community for those who know um, Kampala. This was in McKinsey Division, like Chisugu, Wabigalo, uh, Namawongo parishes. We were going door to door um, asking everyone we could find to give us a sputum sample for expert ultra testing 
Uh, we also on the weekends would set up a tent and hold a screening event and encourage everybody nearby. People would line up and provide us with sputum. And we ended up testing about 12,000 people or about 35% of the estimated adult population of this geographically defined study area during each of our two campaigns, once in 2019 and again in 2021. The top panel on this figure shows the people who were being diagnosed through routine health services at the areas for TB diagnostic and treatment centers over this period. And then the purple bars stacked on top of them show the additional people that we diagnosed with expert positive TB through our community screening campaigns. And in the first campaign in 2019, the prevalence of an expert positive result among our community screening participants was nearly 1%. And then two years later, in sort of the same size and seemingly, I mean, the people who participated in our second campaign had seemingly similar characteristics, but the prevalence of expert positivity among that group was 45% lower, estimated prevalence ratio 0.55. And I mean, I think we've given a lot of thought to what, you know, this was, to what explains this. This was not a, um, randomized controlled trial. And so, you know, we can't say that this was entirely due to this intervention. There was a lot going on. But I, we take this as evidence that this sort of intensive activity in the community, this active case finding, plus the various things that went along with it, really did lead to a reduction in the community level burden of TB. It's possible that it was not just the case finding, but also the increased TB awareness on the behalf of community residents and local healthcare providers that came along with it, making people, you know, that caused maybe the health facility diagnosis to remain high despite a declining uh, disease burden as we did case finding, and even despite the interruptions that came with COVID, because this is, you know, this was in 2020. Um, it's possible there were secular trends in burden of TB more broadly, although current estimates from WHO are that the incidence of TB in Uganda was pretty flat during this period. It's possible that COVID, even though it like interrupted TB services a lot of places and is thought to have overall increased the burden of TB, it's possible that in this community, the any interruptions in services were outweighed by reductions in contact rates and people's exposure to others and opportunities for respiratory transmission. Um, but so this is our sort of observational findings about or our uncontrolled findings about what this sort of intensive intervention in a community can do. We do think it's consistent with what was seen in a cluster randomized trial in Vietnam, the ACT-3 uh, cluster randomized trial that did a similar type of screening, you know, screened um, intervention communities with expert uh, on sputum with a similar level of coverage to what we had in our study in Uganda. And then they, they did that yearly for three years. And then in the fourth year compared the prevalence of TB in these intervention communities to control communities and found that the communities that had been undergoing screening had a 44% lower uh, prevalence of TB. And they also saw some evidence of reduction, reduced transmission to children in those communities. So I think I'm arguing that active case finding, I guess in terms of trying to answer the question of whether active case finding is worth doing, I think the answer is said a kind of yes, but uh, a lot, I think we have reason to believe that a lot of mycobacterium tuberculosis transmission comes from people with TB who aren't yet seeking care, including people with subclinical TB. We have empiric data that shows intensive active case finding can be impactful at a population level on TB burden. We have these models that suggest preventive therapy also plays a critical role. And if we're gonna do case finding, we should be thinking about pairing it with um, preventive therapy. It's hard to do, it's resource intensive and resources limit the extent of population-wide screening or prevention, the coverage or frequency that it's realistic to do. So I think the value of doing uh, active case finding depends on whether we can deliver these interventions efficiently. And with that in mind, I wanted to spend just a couple more minutes telling you about uh, a study that we're doing in Uganda now, which I think we feel like is a demonstration that this can be done fairly effectively, but that also still needs a lot of work to optimize and figure out how to do this well and develop better tools. 
I think it's motivated by saying that in that STOMP TB study in Kampala, I was telling you about a minute ago, doing that kind of universal sputum testing is good as a research tool, but it's inefficient. And so we wanted to look at whether mobile chest X-ray uh, with artificial intelligence inter interpretation could be successfully implemented and a more effective, a more cost-effective way about to go about doing the screening. We're also sort of had con sort of competing um, hypotheses coming out of that study in terms of where would be the best place to do active case finding. Doing it at a health facility has advantages in terms of access to diagnostic testing, easy linkage to care when you find people with TB. It was a place people told us they would like to be screened for TB when they were sitting in a waiting area or visiting someone or passing by the health center. But we also know that there may be communities that have particularly high burdens of undiagnosed TB who may have less access to care and be unlikely, uh, less likely to access uh, screening that's located at health facilities. So we're conducting this study now called Chase TB, which is a cluster randomized trial of two different approaches to delivering a cap package of active case finding and preventive therapy. And we're looking, we're comparing effectiveness of these two location-based strategies, also looking at implementation and cost effectiveness and using some modeling to estimate impact. Here are pictures of our team advertising and conducting our x-ray screening in a uh, community-based setting uh, tent that we set up each day. The study at an individual level is screening people with x-ray, offering sputum testing to those whose, whose x-rays look like they might be TB, and you know, for linking to treatment, anyone who's diagnosed with TB, and then also trying to do the preventive therapy piece. Anyone who doesn't have TB based on x-ray or sputum gets evaluated for preventive therapy eligibility, including tuberculin skin testing for a lot of participants. And we're comparing these two location-based approaches. Should we screen people who are visiting a health facility for any reason, or should we take our screening to the communities that have the highest TB burden? It's a multiple period uh, crossover trial where each of the eight intervention communities alternates between these two versions of the intervention. We also have some control communities for secondary comparisons. Each cluster is the catchment area of one of the health facilities where we're doing the facility-based intervention. And the primary outcome we're looking at is the number of residents who initiate treatment for TB from these geographic areas. So not only the people we're diagnosing with um, through our screening, but at counting the total number of TB uh, notifications from these clusters. Um, and so far we've uh, been going for about 16 months and screened more than 34,000 people and diagnosed just under 1% of them with expert positive TB. Uh, so I think, I think we've been pleasantly surprised by how feasible it has been to implement this sort of community-based mobile chest X-ray screening. We're doing some work on to optimize a number of aspects of this, including what cutoffs we use and have a fellow Juwan uh, Sung with our team who's been looking at sort of optimizing those thresholds by individual, like tailoring them to individual characteristics and risk factors. I won't go into the details there. But I think the challenges we're still facing are how to improve testing uptake and completion. Uh, they've been low. We need more affordable same-day tests if we're really going to try to find people with infection and give them all preventive therapy. We also need ways to identify and target high-risk individuals so we're not trying to treat everyone. And when you start doing x-ray screening, you find people who you think might have TB but are sputum negative. Need to, we need to figure out whether to treat them. You also find non-TB findings. You might find someone who looks like they may have heart failure or lung cancer and really do need um, referral mechanisms to make sure to use this as an opportunity to provide care for other problems also. I'm going to end here for the sake of time because I really do want to have time to discuss any questions. But just to summarize, I think most people with TB haven't accessed the healthcare system. Uh, and that this means lengthy subclinical disease courses, potential for a lot of transmission before people seek care. We have reason to think that population wide uh, TB screening um, is challenging but potentially impactful. And we need more work to design more efficient and feasible strategies, including focusing on maybe certain forms of TB that are most likely to cause transmission or future morbidity and mortality, identifying hotspots of prevalence or transmission, and figuring out whether and how we should be combining screening with prevention. Big thanks to my team at Johns Hopkins and in Uganda. Um, and I would love to answer some questions or just get, get thoughts on this.
I see a hand clap there. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kendall, uh, for that very interesting and uh, informative talk. Uh, anyone who wants to go first with the first question, please go with, uh, I see Andy. Dr. Nan uh, has a question. Hi, Emily. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much. I'm a sorry that I can't, it was only able to come in so late. I had a conflicting uh, obligation, but uh, this is a terrifically interesting area and one that's interested me for uh, over a decade uh, since uh, I, I guess that f f first detect TB trial. Um, I'm aware and have often pointed out that uh, this is what we did in most developed countries to get a handle on TB and wondered why we weren't doing it elsewhere. Um, the the uh, uh, I, I'm interested in in uh, what the basis is for the facility based uh, uh, approach because uh, uh -huh. from everything I know that's uh, and and as well as from the preliminary comments you've made about your ongoing trial that seems less likely to be a uh, a highly productive approach. Yeah, well, so it's not just people who are coming in with symptoms. It's anyone who passes by the health, people who are passing by, people who are visiting someone, people are coming for preventive services. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah, so the idea is that it's a way to get a lot of people screened who, you know, wouldn't be, who aren't coming for TB testing and has less potential for sort of loss to follow up and barriers to getting. I think the problem with going out into remote community settings is you find TB and then how do you get people treated? That's the that's the barrier. So yeah, I, we'll see. Um, but uh, I think there, yeah, people who have TB may be coming to, the, to health facilities for other reasons, but not getting screened for TB. That's I, I guess to. maybe the question, right question to ask is what kind of facilities are you using? Yeah, Since these I are assume... these are basically like district hospitals. They're health center fours and district hospitals. Uh -huh. So it's not TB clinics. No, I mean, they they have <laughs> TB. I mean, they have TB services at here, but yeah, it's uh -huh. not. Yeah, it, it, it's general. Um, okay. Yeah, general health services. And and uh, uh, in terms of screening, are you using you, you're using X rays or you're using just mm -hmm. a sputum? Or yeah, we're we're using X-ray. We're using um, so this I can I showed a couple of pictures of it, but this oh, like very okay. sort of rugged but highly portable you know digital X-ray equipment that has um, the the QXR uh, uh, artificial intelligence software from Cure.ai oh, that you know gives okay. an immediate uh, result in terms of likelihood of having TB and people who are we're we're, then we're doing expert testing on people who have even subtle possible TB uh -huh. abnormalities. And those are being used in the facilities as well as in the pot in the community based. Yeah, yeah. so we, uh, the, our facility approach is sort of setting up a tent on the grounds of the facility. Okay. It's not actually like inside the hospital, okay. but yes, it's and yeah, e each version. I mean, we had screening you know a couple hundred people per week per site, and yeah. Oh well, that gets th th that I guess gets very interesting then because then mm -hmm. it's not clear. Uh, whether you really need to go out if you get a lot of people that way. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, any other questions or comments, Susan? Hey, Emily, it's Sarah Ald. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk and all the great work you're doing. I was curious more about the digital chest x-rays and the algorithm. Does it give sort of a binary Yes, no, or no, it gives a continuous score. This particular one is like on a zero to one scale. And we've been trying to, so we've been trying to figure out what to do with that. The sort of manufacturer recommended cutoff was 0.5. We found we were still finding a pretty high prevalence of TV around that cutoff. So we've kept lowering it. We're down at 0.1 now, which goes through, gives a prevalence sort of similar to the background prevalence in the population. Um, but yeah, it's a continuous score, which allows us, you know, to consider things like, I'll go back to this a uh, couple of slides back. Some nice work that our my current ID fellow has been doing uh, that, you know, you can choose 
maybe based on we've done this so far for sex, but you can maybe incorporate multiple risk factors and sort of, you know, optimize your, your scut cutoff, use a higher score in people who have lower risk and lower score in people who have higher risk so that you're kind of tailoring it to the pretest probability of a positive expert that you would want to use for testing in a given individual. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems like the same spectrum of subclinical that we have with all of our other testing and tools probably applies here as well. And, you know, whatever population the manufacturer validated their cutoffs on might not have included some of those folks. Right. Yeah. Um, Juwan's hoping to do a K award to, to see what happens if you develop models sort of trained on local data and on uh, sort of screening data rather than, you know, sick patients with TB from the whatever hospital supplied the training data set. Yeah. Very cool, thank you. Thanks. I see Dr. Whalen has a hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Emily, thanks for such a wonderful talk and all the great work you're doing. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I, I, I just, uh, I guess one comment and then, uh, or maybe two comments that, that you can respond to. Um, you know, at, um, uh, going back to sort of the standard epidemiologic definition of latent, mm -hmm. uh, a latent condition that uh, Rothman talks about, it's actually very different from how we use it in the TB world, you know, because he talks about it in terms of component causes and that when all of the component causes for an individual have been, are in that person, the latent period is from the time that that person is destined to have the disease until they actually develop the disease. Now he developed that sort of in the cancer world, but it, but it really, I, I've been sort of toying with the idea that maybe that's incipient disease, that what we should talk about is that- Do you say that, that maybe a lot a, of the people who get labeled as having latent infection wouldn't be under that definition because they're not destined to have the disease, yeah. Yeah, they, they don't have all of the component causes and may never have all those component causes as we know happens, right? right. You know, most people with infection never develop disease. So they actually never enter the phase of latent. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I've thought that, I mean, my candidate for renaming incipient would be latent and then something else for what we call latent TB. I know. But I, I, I don't, going around, but, mm -hmm. the, the dogma in TB tells me that that's never something that's going to happen. But um, I think it's worth understanding that because it, it helps realize the diversity of issues that may that may lead to the development of TB. We kind mm -hmm. of see it as a progressive illness and probably isn't. I mean, granuloma are probably forming and breaking down and forming and breaking down all the time. And right. sometimes it causes symptoms, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's infectious and sometimes it's, it do, it's not. So, um, um, so after all, after centuries, we still don't fully have a good nomenclature for TV. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other question I had, um, I, I know that there, the, I, the work that you're doing in Uganda is wonderful. And I really appreciate the, that the sort of widespread case finding in a, in a given area and, and following up and sort of a pre-post uh, analysis. Um, and but, you know, there have been lots of community-based studies of, of uh, active case finding, and I'm sure you're aware of them. And they really show, you know, equivocal results. You know, there's some that show that, the, that it works, some that show that it doesn't seem to work so much. Others, it gets to a matter of sustainability, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, how do we, if it works, how do we keep it going? And I wonder right. if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, one of the questions in terms of how, like, how intensive do you have to be? Like, how much do you really need to get that burden of transmission down if you want to make a, have a sustainable impact? You know, if you have a lot of people who are, you know, recently infected, I, I, I think, I think there's reason um, to think that it's hard, to, like if transmission is too high, like it's very high, then you need really intensive repeated case finding to be able to make an impact. Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of the 
some of the strongest studies around the most intensive, you know, sort of versions of case finding interventions, excluding the ones that are in just like impossibly high transmission settings that we would just you know, really need extremely high intensive intervention to address, I think do show evidence of impact. But yeah, I think the sustainability and I think the question of how much do we need preventive therapy? We're doing some modeling now. I have some hypotheses of why these models that say preventive therapy rather than the case finding itself gives you most of the impact. So I have some like hypotheses about what like that those models may be overestimating things on the prevent on like the preventive therapy impact side that we're exploring now. But um, but yeah, the question of like how much do you need to do more than just the people who are sputum positive? Uh, I think is an important question. And you know, how much is preventive therapy the piece that uh, makes for sustainability of impact if you don't want to do just constant, you know, every year or even more frequently than that active case finding. Yeah. Yeah, I I uh, I wish we had a post infection vaccine. Yeah. You know, and instead of a ther oral therapy, you know, you you give a vaccine that really mod moderates the risk of developing TB, and you right. and you wouldn't need biomarkers as to whether this person was likely to pro progress or not progress. But you had a a vaccine that you could target the individuals that you know were infected, and um, you know block that path to to disease. You know, right. And um, I guess my understanding is that immunologists are thinking that a vaccine like M7, like the, the um, sort of post-infection vaccine that's in um, that's like entering phase three trials uh, is, you know, it's being evaluated as a post-infection vaccine. My understanding is that like the thinking is that it should also prevent progression to disease in people who haven't yet been infected at the time of vaccination, but who are. So yeah, it could potentially be really valuable at a, you know, just population wide, we'll give it to everyone, regardless yeah. of whether they've already been infected yet or not, will could prevent them from developing disease. Yeah. yeah definitely. I, I, I worry about mass vaccination because it didn't work for smallpox. And, you know, I think we need better strategies that, mm -hmm. that are more focused toward the people that, or toward outbreaks or or yeah, something. I think there's a lot of work so, to be done, and it's like thinking ahead lot, yeah. with a vaccine in sight. Maybe what do we? How do we combine these various interventions and do it's like Don't targeted like, combinations of case finding, prevention, plus vaccination? And where do you need to do? Where will you need to do them all? Yeah. Have yeah, you right. considered randomizing your your or or just following up your people who are found? Since Chris's point is a great point, we don't actually know if all of these people who are lighting up like Chris, blinking like Christmas trees with blinking lights on the PET scans that uh, Cliff Berry's group shows us, uh, we don't know if those people are really gonna progress to active disease or not. Mm -hmm. And they may be exactly the people who are gonna turn off and control the disease. Yeah. And the ones that are negative in your study are the ones who are at risk to, for disease. So it would be great if you could follow up uh, a, a cohort and uh, uh, and see if, in fact, these people you identify are the people. I guess there's a little bit of evidence that doing this kind of mass screening and treating people in this context will lower incidence, but we don't know that real well yet. And you could uh, follow up. Yeah, no, up I think there's just... room. Like, you know, there are people you, you find them, you treat them. And so you're not going to know what would have happened. But I think there are groups that we can follow longitudinally. I have a cohort of people who tested trace positive on expert ultra during screening that we're following off treatment to try to, oh, you know, understand the amount of progression yeah. to disease. I'm also interested in the people who have x-rays that look like a TB that are sputum uh -huh. negative and, you know, following up those. And we're planning to call people with that um, sort of set of findings in our uh, in that Chase TB trial to figure out how many of them get diagnosed with TB, like develop sputum positive TB later. But yeah. Not, not to, I, and I guess now you're an expert on the genetic testing permissions for both uh, of those reports. Sorry. Oh, thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of our hour i'm sure there might have been some other comments but these were all uh, very interesting questions and i uh, thank you dr kendall for 
uh, this very, very engaging talk. And we really appreciate your time and, and, and all the great work that you're doing in Uganda, of course, with the rest of the team. And with that, I would like to thank everyone who has been able to uh, join this seminar and to remind you that our next seminar is coming up November 30th. So thank you very much and we'll see you again. Thanks so much.